I'd like to introduce our speaker. She is a women's health advocate and an integrative gynecologic oncologist in clinical practice since 1999. Dr. Singh received her medical degree from Northwestern University and a master's degree from the Harvard School of Public Health. She completed an obstetrics and gynecolo gynecology residency at the John Hopkins Hospital and a gynecological oncology fellowship at MD Anderson Cancer Center. She completed her doctoral degree in public health on cost analysis at the University of Texas School of Public Health and an associate fellowship in integrative medicine at the University of Arizona. So as you can tell, she is well informed about this topic. So I'm handing it over to you. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you guys for coming. Feel free to move up. We're, we've got a more intimate group, and that's always really nice. There was a lot of information on the slides. That's why I was checking that you guys have access. I'm not going to talk about everything on the slides, but I wanted you to have the resource. And apparently, Juanita hasn't um, uploaded it yet to our session, but it'll be available. And as Sandy was mentioning, I guess there'll be there will be a recording, you can always look back. Um, so we titled it this, but what we're really doing is this. We're really talking about integrative approaches to cancer. Um, but that can be defined in lots of different ways, hence the other title first. But we're gonna talk about what that means. And um, I always start out with abbreviations and definitions for two reasons. One, you guys will see the slides are chock full of information, and it's just a way to, you'll have access to those slides, reference back. Um, so the automatic nervous system, that's our nervous system that's made up of the fight or flight, SNS, sympathetic nervous system, the rest and digest, the parasympathetic nervous system. I use CA for cancer, some people don't like that. I just put lots of info on my slides. Um, DX for diagnosis, follicle stimulating hormone, we're gonna talk a little about menopause, so that's FSH. I use GI for gastrointestinal. GSM, you know, there's some medical words I don't love. This is one I kind of do love. So it's genital urinary symptoms of menopause. And I think it's because sometimes we just say, oh, like vaginal dryness. And it's obviously more complicated than that, right? It's vulvovaginal dryness. It's being more prone to infection and bladder infections. All of those things are about the changes that happen to the vulva. So I, I kind of like the GSM. Um, NAMS is the North American Menopause Society. And I'm going to try to give you guys what, what give you all what I think are some good um, resources, and they are a very good resource. They're a little on the cautious side, um, but caution is good, I think, in lots of ways, and they um, regularly update all their, um, their handouts and other things that they have access to. So a good resource, OS for overall survival, PA, physical activity, we're gonna talk a lot about that, PARP, um, poly ADP ribose polymerase, those are proteins that are part of the DNA repair process. And there are these, um, we've developed drugs that are called PARP inhibitors that specifically take advantage of some of the genetic changes that some of the inherited predispositions, um, those specific genetic changes, PARP seems to work especially good for. Um, PFS, progression-free survival, means kind of the time um, from when a cancer happens to when it comes back. Progression-free survival. QOL, quality of life. We're going to talk a lot about QOL. RCT, randomized control trials. We are really lucky that a lot of the interventions we look at have been studied in kind of what we consider our gold standard, best way to study things, where we're looking at one intervention to one outcome, and everything else is randomized. And so ideally, you get the best data from that. We'll talk a little bit about that. I use RX for prescription, SC for side effects. SR, another kind of study we're gonna look at a lot. Systematic reviews and meta-analyses. So that's like when we have lots of studies, sometimes of smaller groups of people that don't um, achieve what we call statistical significance. 
and when you bunch them together, either statistically in meta-analysis or conceptually, by having like a real um, evaluation program for what makes a study good and doesn't. So it's another way of looking at data. Um, and again, we're lucky a lot of the interventions we're looking at have had enough studies done that we're able to do these systematic reviews. I'm gonna mention a little bit about SSRIs and SNRIs. Those are drugs in that Prozac um, uh, category that basically um, they keep your body from absorbing serotonin, and serotonin is one of these chemical measure, uh, sorry, chemical messengers that is part of mood and appetite and sleep and digestion and inter you know interacts with a lot of things, and is inherently related to our autonomic nervous system, and closely also related to a lot of um, how some of the mind, body, and herbal therapies we use interact and have their impact. I use SY for symptom, I use TX for therapy or treatment, and I use VMS, and here's another medical term I like. Lots of them I don't like, and you guys will get that, but VMS, vasomotor symptoms, and I like it because it's not just hot flashes, right? Sandy was also just talking about temperature dysregulation being the wrong temperature. Some people it's sweating, some people it's a temperature issue. Um, and, and truthfully, like, when I was a resident, I was told, like, this was all in our mind. Now we've figured out like what's the actual receptor in the brain and we finally have a medication that actually works on that. Um, all right, so that was just definitions. We had a lot to talk about. Um, <laughs> so our goals for our time together, right? Approaches to getting the longest, best quality of life with cancer. We're gonna talk about nutrition. We're gonna talk about whole foods and dietary approaches physical activity, kind of thinking about the range, including rehab. Um, we're gonna talk about mind-body medicine and stress management, some of the specific tools, um, looking at acupuncture, herbs. Um, and then I'm gonna talk a little bit about some symptoms that I think are particularly important that I often get a ton of questions about, menopause-related symptoms and kind of the things that come from hormonal withdrawal things like those VMS, vasomotor symptoms, decreased libido, the GSM, the vulvovaginal dryness. Um, we'll talk not specifically about cancer-related fatigue, but you'll see it comes up over and over as we talk about effective therapies. And then I'm gonna just, at the end, do a real quick integrative approaches to surgery, mostly because it lets us kind of go through how all of these different kinds of interventions can be used you know, for one specific thing. So we talk a lot, and I'm sure a lot of today you guys are spending learning about what we consider standard therapy, right? Best surgery, best chemo, best radiation, thinking about the exact right, you know, stage for stage or genetics for genetics, um, targeted therapies and immune therapies. But we know it takes a lot more than that, right? So we think about things like how we eat, physical activity, stress management, social support, right? You guys being here are already like achieving social support. Um, the things we probably shouldn't do, things that make things um, worse, smoking, drinking too much alcohol. Um, I always keep you sunscreen in here because I have close friends who are dermatologists, but also because I talk a lot about vitamin D. Um, and we kind of come up against, you know, risks and benefits in that space. Sleep, 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 getting enough sleep is such an important part of health about cancer prevention and surviving cancer. We're not gonna spend a ton of time just based on we don't have enough time about environment, but how I think about environment is there's the things we control, the foods we buy, the products we put on our skin, and then there's the things we can't control, you know, and you know, having some peace with the things we can't and can't control. So, what is integrative medicine? What is integrative oncology? I mostly think of it as kind of like thinking about a whole person. In Western medicine, we mostly think about symptoms and diagnoses and how to address those. And this whole person approach, I think, is really important, especially in cancer care, because again, we get really focused on cancer cure. We're all about cancer cure, and sometimes quality of life and the person get lost in that. Um, the other thing I think about integrative medicine and integrative oncology in particular is that we think more about our own innate healing abilities and how do we harness those, how do we put those to work for us. Um, 
And understanding that stress nervous system comes into play there, and that's why I keep it in my definitions, because we're going to talk about it throughout, and it matters. And, you know, you'll hear the term complementary, you'll hear all these other words. And what I like about integrative, it means that they all are important, right? Every one of these things is as important, and we'll talk a little bit about what we know about the science. So why aren't these treatments? I talked about we have randomized control trials. Those are perfect. We have systematic reviews. Why aren't they standard therapy? There's a bunch of reasons. Some of them are historical and political. I think some of them are just this Western medicine bias of like, oh, that's lay medicine or indigenous. And I mean, literally, we created this term old wives tale, which is like pejorative three times over. Um, for things like sleep and rest and eating better and all those things that actually now we have to go back and rescue and bring them back into medicine because we gave them up. Um, and then I think it's just, you know, without getting too deep into it, about our profit-driven system where all the billing codes and all this junk are based on diagnoses. So if you don't have a diagnosis, well, somehow it's not important. And we lost things in that process too. Um, the other thing is we just haven't been really researching this very long. The National Center for, and again, they use the term complementary and integrative health. I mean, 1999 is when it started, right? That's when I started practice, 1999. Um, and still, we haven't done all the research that we should. Um, and then it's hard in some ways, right? When we talk about whole system research, it's a lot harder than like one outcome, carboplatin and ovarian cancer survival, right? Those two things are a little, and even those aren't easy or straightforward and can be complicated. The FDA um, in the United States does not regulate herbs or supplements. They do in Europe, and so some of the data we get comes from Europe because they study these things as drugs. But because they don't study them or consider them drugs, they consider them foods, they don't need to be labeled well, and they aren't always. They don't have to be quality controlled. And so the you know access to things and choosing the right supplements takes guidance like it does for everything else. Um, and then there's a part of it that we don't know as in like, okay, here's an echinacea plant. There's a flower. There's leaves. There's a stem. There's roots. What part of the plant is doing the immune therapy? What part of the plant is doing the things that we want? We don't always know because that's not how it was used necessarily in herbal preparations. And so learning that part of it takes a lot of science. And again, you don't make three trillion zillion dollars off echinacea. And so getting people like, you know, invested in doing the research to figure those pieces out can also be challenging. Um, and again, like integrative approaches, thinking whole body, not one intervention, one outcome. And that part is tough. Um, I'm going to take two seconds to talk about placebo effect. So in science, all of our drugs by the FDA have to be, in quote, better than placebo. Prozac, its very, very first study, and every study ever since, is just barely better than placebo. Now, what does that mean? Like, oh, it's all in our mind? No. It means that our mind is a powerful thing. And when we engage in the process of taking care of ourselves, we engage those mechanisms. We turn off our fight or flight. We turn on our parasympathetic. We engage other parts. That's what mind-body medicine is, right? And so then when we say, oh, there's basically somewhere between a 20 and 30% placebo effect to most trials and most therapies on all kinds of outcomes, it again speaks to like, we've been so kind of, I don't know, placebo, that's like low, as opposed to placebo, damn, 20%. There's lots of cancer ter therapies that we don't get 20% responses to that we use. Um, all right, so I'm going to pop through some quick studies. So some of the whole person studies, again, hard to do. This is um, what we call a population-based prospective, so not randomized. They just took people who had healthy diets and um, healthy behaviors, and they were very simplistic in the sense of plenty of fruits and vegetables was diet, and unhealthy behaviors were things like smoking, um, alcohol use. And these were sort of the first studies that started saying to us, having a healthy behavior and a healthy diet lifestyle 
improved cancer outcomes, right? Now we're gonna talk about this 2.5 hours per week of moderate intensity physical activity, PA, associated with a 25% reduction in the risk of dying of breast cancer. Like, that's pretty darn amazing. And people go on tamoxifen and aromatase inhibitors without achieving that 25% goal. For a five or 10%, now I, I'm not, I'll take five, I'll take one, like whatever is worth it to you for your, you know, the benefit of risks and things. But just thinking like, maybe insurance should be covering like the gym, right? If these are really the cancer outcomes that we can get. Um, but we're going to use that, hear that number a lot. And these were some of the first studies that started showing that to us. Now, there was an actual randomized control trial done in prostate cancer by a really brilliant man, Dean Ornish, who did a lot of work in cardiac um, diets and health, took a group of men with early prostate cancer where the option and even the recommendation was we're going to keep an eye on you. These, these are early, slow growing. We don't necessarily have to do treatment. And they had to do the Dean Ornish diet, which I will say is a lot harder um, than kind of now our current recommendations. Um, they were um, pushed to exercise. I think there, there was about 30 minutes, same, I think it was five to seven days a week. Um, they all were taught mindfulness-based um, stress reduction, and they were all part of a support group, and then there was the regular people. And even in a very short time, in a two-year follow-up, they found that like, None of the people in the experimental group had cancer progression and so needed to go on to regular therapy as opposed to six of the people in the control group. Um, the blood uh, measure that we use to measure prostate cancer, prostate-specific antigen, went down in the experimental group, went up in the control group. They took the serum of the people in the experimental group, put it in petri dishes with prostate cancer cells, and found that the serum decreased cell growth comparing the experimental control, and even following these people long-term found that they had improvements in their long-term health outcomes. What's really interesting about this study, and you listen to Dean Ornish talking about it now, he's got a bunch of YouTube videos, um, the thing that they stayed with the most, where it's not diet, second was exercise, but number one, the support groups. The support groups stayed engaged, so again, right, you guys are already doing that. Um, all right, so physical activity. I have like three slides here with tons of info that says the same thing over and over. <laughs> right, there's consistent evidence in multiple cancer types that shows that physical activity improves cancer outcomes and quality of life. Um, most of the data we have is for breast cancer and colon cancer, also some pretty strong data for prostate cancer, but we're adding it up for the other cancers. But what I love about this 2020 systematic review where they brought these 136 studies together was this last part, compared with pre-diagnosis physical activity, post-diagnosis physical activity was associated with a greater decrease in cancer-specific and all-cause mortality with a greater than 30% decrease in the risk of all-cause mortality in all cancers, and then that list of cancers, and that number is extremely statistically significant. Why do I care so much about that? Because I think when you have cancer, I spend so much time with people I care for talking about the woulda, coulda, shouldas. I shoulda quit smoking, I coulda eaten better, blah, blah, blah. You know what? The stuff you do after diagnosis is actually almost, in this, in this realm, is more important than what happened before. So forget about yesterday, right here, and moving forward, and this is the effectiveness we see. Um, other cancers showed benefits, and you know, just for the sake of being balanced, no harm was seen, which is something obviously we care about. We don't expect to see it, but you know, um, and then these were the studies that when we gather them together, again, why we got that magic number of 150 minutes of moderate activity a week. These studies showed it over and over, comes mostly from breast cancer, but has repe been repeated in colon and prostate cancers. 150 minutes a week, that is 30 minutes five times a week, right? How much time do we spend tick? talk, email, blah, blah, 30 minutes is a really short amount of time. And 
we saw benefits. I was talking about survival and cancer outcome mostly, but for cancer-related fatigue, for sleep, for mood, for hot flashes, for vasomotor symptoms in general, for chemo brain, right? Something we really have a hard time with. Um, and um, how I talk to people about it is do some, you know, mix up cardio, strength training, think about mixing them up intervals. And sometimes we make it like, oh my God, I need to like get a trainer and go to the gym and I gotta sweat and it's gotta be there for 90 minutes, blah, blah. No, you need a decent bra and a good supportive pair of tennis shoes. <laughs> you turn on your music and you dance around the house, right? Dance around the room, whatever. You do it for 20 minutes. You know, you can even pick out the song so you know it's that long. And then you have your cool down songs. And in that, maybe you do your little weights. Maybe you do your stretches and you get that 30 minutes five times a week. Um, we, we make it so hard on ourselves because we sort of feel like there's some like perfect way of being. Like I got to run a marathon. Like I am never running a marathon, but I can still get my 150 minutes a week, right? Um, I got my pictures of my dog there because, right, Walk in your dog. Now, first they do their sniff, pee, poo business, and that's not really an interval, but like, then you're walking, right? You walk with them. Um, and then knowing that like, there might be specific things people need, right? Chair exercises. I used to have this great exercise therapy, uh, physiologist who like, she could make you sweat doing a chair routine. You know, and you really can if you go on YouTube. There's so many, uh, so much accessibility to if you look up chair routine for knee injury or hip arthritis or something, you can come up with options. And then there are times that we need physical therapy. And, you know, from physical therapy, we can like blend right into yoga, where there's a lot of great research on yoga in general. MD Anderson does some of this great research, but we see benefits for depression, for anxiety for cancer-related fatigue, again, like chemo brain, something we're not very good at treating. Um, and, you know, again, these are these systematic reviews and meta-analyses, 26 studies, 16 studies, 34 randomized control trials, right? The best kind of trials we have in medicine. There's a lot of chemo drugs out there that we do not have 34 studies of. Um, and again, we see these consistent benefits on all kinds of symptoms, quality of life, fatigue, nausea and vomiting, sleep quality, anxiety, depression, distress. Um, it's tricky, you know, if you go out there, like there's different styles, there's different ways they studied it, there's um, you know, restorative yoga, hatha yoga, like jump up and down vinyasa yoga. Um, but there's consistency across all these studies that tells us there's something you know, that they're all getting. And so again, it's like anything else, you choose the one that works for you. And truly it's a combination of like exercise and breathing techniques. Um, some of the really interesting early studies of physical activity, when in breast cancer looked at a group of women who had sedentary jobs, like they sat at a computer all day, but then they exercised that 30 minutes five times a week and then a group of women who had really physically active jobs. They're teachers, nurses, they're on their feet all day, a minimum of five hours of a day working. Um, and then um, they were the ones who had both the physically active jobs and exercised, and then they had people who had the sedentary job and the um, didn't exercise. Who had the very best cancer outcomes? The combination of a physically active job and um, exercising, who had the second best? 30 minutes, five times a week. Then the people with physically, and now why is that? That's the mind-body part of things. When we're physically active at work, we do get the cardio benefit, we do build our muscles, we do get our blood you know, out there with oxygen, but we don't get the stress management part of it because we're stressed and we're multitasking and we're working. So physical activity is a kind of mind-body medicine and you know, I mentioned earlier, right, the autonomic nervous system. This is the gory details, right? It's a balance between our fight or flight nervous system, the sympathetic nervous system, the rest and digest. But it's not supposed to be balanced. It's supposed to be parasympathetic on 80% of the time or more. But we are the opposite how we live. And why is that? Now, we need our stress nervous system, right? It gets turned on when we drive, and we need it. 
right? Because you need quick reflexes and you need to be able to pay attention to all the crazies and all of that kind of thing. But there's a lot of things that turn on our stress nervous system that don't actually need a physical response. When we grieve, when we worry, when we're in pain, um, when we multitask, we turn on our stress nervous system. There is a caveman in us that has one response to everything. And the hard thing about this is, one, we don't recognize it as stress because it's just how we live, right? And so we don't think, like, if you know you're stressed, maybe you think, oh, i got to take a deep breath or i got to do something. But if you don't really recognize it because it's just how you exist, and honestly, you kind of like it. I mean, listen to how fast I'm talking, right? Like, I probably exist at this pace, and I'm used to it, and I like it. But the physical impact it has on me is a part we have to think about. So, oops, am I not? There we go. Um, so what happens? Your sympathetic nervous system's on, your heart rate goes up, your blood pressure goes up. That's not the most important piece of us for cancer, though. What it also turns on is this whole cascade of inflammatory markers. And that's because our body thinks it's going to be attacked, and it is preparing itself for that, right? Now, parallel to this, like just to sneak a little diet info in there, the little markers in our body, the inflammatory markers, the building block of them are omega-6 fats. Those are the fats that are in most things. The parasympathetic, rest to digest, the anti-inflammatory uh, product, the little building block for that, omega-3 fats. And imagine, it used to be that if you eat beef, if you eat chicken, you would get omega-3 fats. But then we changed how we fed our food supply and so suddenly, those are omega-6 based. And then we're like multitasking all the time, and we're only eating omega-6s. You can imagine that's where inflammation comes from. And most of the diseases that we take care of, cardiac disease, um, cancer, obesity, are related to these chronic elevation of these inflammatory markers. And the truth is, in Western medicine, we spend all our time and energy like on those diseases. In integrative medicine, and now you'll hear the term lifestyle medicine, we're trying to like get to that chronic stress and activation as opposed to the end results of that. Um, sidestep, but not really a sidestep. Just remembering that many women have experienced some aspect of sexual harassment, sexual trauma, and that that's a kind of stress we don't think and talk about. And then when you introduce a cancer diagnosis and treatment, potentially you are reactivating some old trauma. Potentially you are creating a new trauma. And in our society, we already have a distorted way of looking at human bodies in general, but I would argue especially women's bodies. So, you know, when we talk, of, we talk about body dysmorphia, now it's like a psychiatric diagnosis. I feel like there's societal body dysmorphia that we're all subjected to. Add the cancer diagnosis, add the people take off your body parts and burn parts of your body and do all this other business, and you're introducing this kind of stress, too, that we kind of put over here because we're like, well, we did that to you to cure you, so be happy, right? as opposed to like, eh, maybe there's something else also turning on those stress hormones. So it is not a lost cause. It is very easy to turn off our sympathetic nervous system. Laughter, right, crying, meditation, hypnosis, prayer, um, guided imagery. Um, there's biofeedback, people do lots of different kinds of tools, heart math, other things you guys will, you know, if you access. Um, my personal favorite is breath work, and um, eh, we're doing okay. I'm talking fast. We can do a little breath work. All right, so we're going to do the four, seven, eight breath. It's my favorite. Honestly, I think it's my favorite because you have to count, and if I'm counting, I can't be thinking and doing. So you are going to breathe in for four, hold for seven, breathe out for eight comes from Ayurvedic medicine. You're supposed to put the tip of your tongue behind your front teeth, breathe in through your nose, and when you breathe out, make like a whooshing noise, a breathing out, really emptying out our stomach. The magic of it, people believe that there's something to the 478. 
Scientifically, we know that when we breathe out longer than we breathe in, and when we pause between those two, that we inherently tell our body we are not being chased by a saber-toothed tiger and that we can turn on our parasympathetic, right? Because if you are running, you always breathe in more than you breathe out. So if we can lengthen the expiration. So usually we do four of these. Some people get a little lightheaded the first, so we're just gonna do two. So we're gonna empty out your lungs. We're gonna breathe in, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, five, six, seven, out, making that whooshing noise, four, five, six, emptying out those lungs, eight, breathe in, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, five, six, seven, out, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I didn't even do the breathing and I'm talking slower, right? <laughs> and then work it into like getting in and out of your car, walking in and out of the office. Um, for a lot of people, you know, do a deep breath when you pick up a phone or when you put down a phone, right? Like try to weave it into your life because we, if we constantly remind our body we are not under attack, we can turn that off. We, there's apps for it, there's phone things for it. And, you know, as we think about the stress nervous system, you know, we have like all our body systems separated out, but they are not separated out, right? They're intertwined. The stress nervous system is inherently part of menopause. That follicle stimulating hormone is very similar structurally to the adrenaline cortisol family of um, hormones. All of these mood related um, neurotransmitters, we were talking about serotonin, interact with them. Melatonin goes down with age and goes down even further with um, uh, menopause. Melatonin's inherently connected to and related to serotonin and of course then related to all the things it does. And suddenly like, wow, you know what? Menopause is not in our minds. There's clear cut physiological reasons for the symptoms that we have. Lots and lots of research in mind-body approaches to menopause. So um, randomized clinical trials, those lovely trials we love, showing um, clinical hypnosis, decreasing vasomotor symptoms um, and scores, um, decreasing anxiety, improved sleep, cognitive behavioral therapy, achieving the same, improving things like hot flashes, studies of guided imagery, studies of mindfulness training, breathing techniques, yoga, tai chi, all of them Im show improvements in um, symptoms of menopause, both the mood liability as well as the vasomotor symptoms, that heat uh, temperature dysregulation. Increased physical activity also being associated with decreased menopause-related symptoms. Acupuncture. There is no reason why acupuncture is not covered by insurance other than insurance companies don't want to pay for it. There are randomized controlled trials, right? This is 2022, a systematic review. Cancer-related pain, 80 randomized controlled trials showing benefit, right? Fatigue, 18 randomized controlled trials showing benefit. Insomnia, quality of life, benefit for specific symptoms, right? Nausea and vomiting during chemo, bone marrow suppression, actually. Seeing improvements in um, bone marrow suppression cancer-specific studies, breast cancer and menopause, things like body aches related um, to menopause itself, but also to aromatase inhibitors that can cause um, pretty significant symptoms. The swallowing issues related to radiation for head and neck cancer. Um, it's tricky to me, uh, one of the tools I used um, chemo, I'm sorry, that I used acupuncture the most for was try to prevent chemo-related peripheral neuropathy, and the studies are inconsistent. That said, I was lucky enough to be in a couple settings where we had key, uh, acupuncture on the unit, on the chemo unit, and that might be the thing, that you need it with the treatment as opposed to the next day or the day after or the day before or whatever when they're not in the same place. Regardless, benefits cancer-related pain, fatigue, insomnia, quality of life, um, Possibly for lymphedema and this stress, uh, this dry throat. But you know, one of the problems, you know, 
it's expensive. It's not covered by insurance. Um, and you need frequent visits. Um, and like other things, like in the beginning for some symptoms, you need it weekly and then you can stretch it out. Um, there are cancer centers that offer it. There's other support places you can look into. Um, I haven't been able to find great like national resources to find things. You sort of have to ask around and look around. So we're gonna change a tiny little bit and pop into nutrition and diet. So back in the 60s, we sort of first started realizing that was true, there's true geographic variation in cancer and in health in general, right? Countries with high meat intake having more colorectal cancer, lower cancer rates in Mediterranean countries, lower breast cancer rates in Japan and China, and you know, animal studies where we manipulated the diet of these rats, mostly male rats because we mostly study men, um, even to the mice level. Um, you guys are laughing, but it's true. It's a different topic, though. We don't have time. <laughs> um, but what's very interesting is back in the day, there was also a lot of, I don't know, semi-racist, like, oh, well, those people are different. Their genes are different. And what we figured out, that's not quite true, because if you take those people and you move them here to our eating habits, what happens? They get the cancer rates of this of this setting, sometimes even higher. Um, and so then we started doing this work to how do we translate these whole diets into active agents and supplements? Because you know we need to put it in a pill or a powder because that's how we're really gonna be effective. So there's a lot of busyness on their slide, but I'm gonna tell you our first look was beta carotene. So yellow and orange fruits and vegetables consistently associated with decreased cancer rates. Now, doing studies of cancer prevention are, are, are really hard because you gotta follow people a long time to prove that they didn't get cancer. That's expensive. So we're thinking about doing this study. Okay, well, why don't we take like a high-risk group? Let's take smokers and people exposed to asbestos because they have a high risk of lung cancer, so at least we have a better chance of proving whether we can you know, prevent it or not. And huh, beta carotene, that's the natural thing, but why don't we like use activated vitamin A because that's gonna be more effective, of course. So they did this trial in almost 20,000 people and showed an almost 30% increase in the risk of lung cancer, 17% increase in the risk of death and an increased risk of cardiovascular death. And what, right? <laughs> The long-term follow-up showed that once we stopped, we could decrease some, although not normalize the risks. But especially among women, there was long-term increased risks of cardiac and all-cause mortality. Another study at the same time around, done only in men, of vitamin E combined with um, beta carotene, again, using a synthetic um, vitamin A and a natural vitamin A. Um, and what they found was the vitamin E decreased lung cancer, didn't decreased prostate cancer, didn't impact lung cancer. Again, the beta carotene and the vitamin A increased the chances of getting lung cancer. What? So vitamin A is called, it's a differentiating agent. What our body uses it for is here's the line, I'm a baby cell and I could be anything and now I'll be a muscle cell. I'm gonna differentiate into that or I'm gonna be a skin cell or I'm gonna be a liver cell and vitamin A is on that path of helping cells differentiate, right? So if you take someone who's got some precancerous changes and you give them an activated differentiating agent, might it not cause that to become cancerous, right? This is why you can't use vitamin A when you're pregnant or trying to get pregnant, um, right? This is why there's all these things when, for skin when we do um, uh, pharmacologic doses of vitamin A, why, yeah, none of, it looks like nobody in here has used vitamin A for that. We have better stuff now. Um, but regardless, like, it, it makes sense in retrospect and it's, it's tricky, right? So maybe the wrong population. But the other issue is like, well, maybe there's something about when you take beta carotene and you combine it with the fiber of a carrot and our body absorbs it in a whole different way than we put it in a capsule and bam, it hits our system, right? Um, 
And then there's the physiology versus pharmacology. Those doses of beta carotene and vitamin A, you could not eat that many carrots, right? And so it's going from a physiologic, a how we live, how we eat, to a pharmacologic. Sometimes we need to do that, but maybe that was a problem. So whole food approaches, um, anti-inflammatory diet, I like this, this is Andy Weil. Also, I didn't even mention, he has a great YouTube video for the 478 breath, um, but it's in your slides when you look at it. Um, the anti-inflammatory diet is essentially the Mediterranean diet and then adding some concepts from Ayurvedic medicine and traditional Chinese medicine of kind of that idea of superfoods. Um, which I, I don't love because I think we know that variety is a big part of good health, but there are some foods that have really um, strong uh, properties, things like potentially right, cooked mushrooms, omega-3 fats, chocolate, right? Nice dark chocolate has some great antioxidants. I'm gonna take a little break off dietary things and just pop into fasting because often people ask me about it. There's a lot of information on here and I want to leave time for questioning. And so what I will say is it potentially makes sense. One, anthropologically, we did have periods of time of the year of other things when we fasted. Before refrigeration, we fasted, right? So the kind of eating from the minute you wake up until you go to bed at night is a part of modern life that wasn't part of how we were built and how we developed um, evolutionarily. And in some ways it makes sense, especially in animal studies, that if you are fasting at the time of chemo and normal cells go, become dormant versus cancer cells don't know how to do that, that maybe you could decrease some of the side effects of chemo. Now, we haven't really proven it yet. The jury's still out. The studies are all ongoing. When people really push me on, like, sh should they try it during therapy, it is hard to be fasting for some chemotherapies might get more nauseated if you have an empty stomach. On the other hand, you know, doing this intermittent fasting of you know, eating dinner early and then eating breakfast a little late so you get 12 plus hours, there may be some real value to that and some of the circadian rhythm research that's happening now sort of supports that same idea that maybe like if we close the number of hours that we're actually consuming and digesting um, that we get some health benefits. Um, Coming back though to superfoods, things like um, fruits and vegetables decreasing breast and ovarian cancer rates, um, higher vitamin D levels being associated with better cure rates for ovarian cancer, um, habitual green tea, which has all these flavonoids in it, being associated with improved outcomes in ovarian cancer, cruciferous vegetables. Cruciferous vegetables are magic, arugula is my favorite less gassy, um, but you know, studies that showed the highest intake of cruciferous vegetables being associated with a decreased risk of getting breast cancer. These isoflavones, cumistins, lignans, right? What foods do we find them in? Lima beans, alfalfa sprouts, um, soy, peanuts, lignans and flaxseed and sesame seeds, we'll talk about those. Um, but again, like just, we're gonna talk about supplements, but remembering that like whole foods and then co consuming things in a whole food way probably gets us the most bang for our buck in spite of how we think about putting things in pills and powders. Now, are there uses? Absolutely, right? Replace deficiencies. Vitamin D is a really challenging one, especially because I don't think we should be spending tons of time in the um, sun and because our food sources have depleted and so lots of people are vitamin D deficient um, and for most people I recommended getting your vitamin D checked and then getting it up to that 50 level um, but then also for managing symptoms and other things and I think about supplements and herbs the same way I think about surgery and chemo and aromatase inhibitors we're gonna look at what the known risks are and side effects. We're gonna look at what the known benefits are. We do clinical trials all the time when we have no idea what the benefit is. We know it has a ton of side effects, but we're weighing those. And then accepting things like acupuncture, yoga, some of the herbal therapies we're gonna talk about, especially when you do it in whole food ways, like teas. 
the actual risk of harm is so low that kind of the potential for benefit has to be raised a little bit. Now, I mentioned before, our FDA doesn't regulate this stuff. And so this is a problem, and this is why you need to work with an integrative medicine person, an herbalist, um, somebody who can help you seek out good, um, safe products, remembering that they are like other medications, right? All kinds of medications decrease the breakdown of some medications and increase the breakdown of others. Well, herbs and supplements do the same thing. They're gonna have those interactions. So having knowledge of it, I just included some resources here. This consumer lab, the W, because you can join for like 20 or $30 a year, I forget how much it is. They do great reviews of herbal supplements. They update them regularly. They tell you which are the reliable ones out there. They review the data, it's a really nice resource. Sloan Kettering also has a really nice website. Um, cancerchoices.org, um, another place where they try to do some evidence-based review, kind of like FORCE. They have a huge medical advisory board. They have a lot of experts who help them come up with the recommendations and the statements that they have um, on their website. And then remembering um, herbs are different, right? They have multiple parts, but they evolved, like herbs evolved with us, right? At some point, some millennium ago, people figured out chamomile was good for us, and so we cultivated it along with us. And chamomile, like, it treats a whole variety of things, right? A lot of herbal therapies evolved to treat a constellation of symptoms like menopause, as opposed to in Western medicine, where we're like, this is the medicine for nausea, and that gives you constipation, and so this is the medicine for constipation, right? We tend to be, as opposed to these drug, these um, products that evolved for, you know, that. So think about chamomile, soothing the GI tract. It's a mild anxiolytic, right, calming. It's anti-inflammatory both topically and internally. And again, like within herbal medicine, so because of the way these products and these plants evolved with us, the concepts around them evolved. And there is a, a concept that we don't really have in Western medicine of something called adaptogens. And that is that the idea of these herbs that can mediate our stress nervous system in a way that helps us, you know, helps our body adjust to chronic stressors, acute stressors, life transitions. I listed some of my favorites there. Again, you wouldn't do it off my slide, choose to take one of these. You would work with a professional who understood these. Um, but just kind of mentioning, like, I've had great luck with Shatavari for fatigue and menopausal symptoms, rhodiola for really, like, hard-to-treat um, uh, cancer-related fatigue, and I'll talk about maca later. But there's lots of supplements, right, for anxiety and insomnia, thinking about melatonin, thinking about 5-HTP, that's the precursor to melatonin and the precursor to serotonin. So, of course, it's like part of mood and sleep at the same time. Valerian, this nighty night extra tea. I personally just can't even stand the smell of valerian, but a lot of people love it, and we'll do some, some other, you know, uh, go over some menopause trials of valerian. But nighty night, plain old traditional medicinal nighty night is passion flower, lemon balm, um, with some chamomile in it, a really nice tea that is pharmacologically active, right? Like has enough of those herbs to be a therapeutic dose. Um, things for nausea and GI, immune support, both astragalus and turmeric. And most of our safety data comes from Europe. Again, I say talk it through with things, but if you're just experimenting, I feel like tea is a really safe place to go. I like the, the traditional medicinal teas because on the back, they tend to give you the exact dose of what's thought to be the um, active part of it. But yogi teas are also really good and really nice blends. Um, for fatigue, uh, those adaptogens. I didn't mention before medicinal mushrooms. Again, really fascinating whole class of organisms that seem to, again, have kind of evolved with us and with trees and with other things. Um, that it would almost make sense, right, 
that they would be supportive of our health. So reishi and cordyceps kind of being more for fatigue. Lion's mane, a really interesting mushroom that I've had really good luck with um, chemo brain. Um, although most of the research on lion's mane is from um, traumatic brain injury. Hot flashes, this one side of this slide I'm not gonna talk about at all, but I put it on there because there are standard prescription-driven therapies that are, are effective, and I didn't wanna act as though there weren't, including that new one I mentioned, the Vioza. Um, but again, lots of integrative approaches dietary herbs, the acupuncture we've talked about, the mind-body we've talked about, physical activity we've talked about. And again, like lots of herbs and supplements used over the you know, millennia in herbal therapies, um, as well as like as we've learned more. The ones um, we'll go into detail, you know, black co-wash is really interesting. It's been approved in Europe for menopause, although not like traditionally indigenously used for hot flashes per se, more for the mood aspects. Um, but again, some good studies showing effectiveness, not any estrogenic effects, right? A lot of the supplements out there do have some estrogenic effects. That's why they're effective. Um, red clover, me, myself, you, working with patients, I haven't found. On the other hand, I know some herbalists who love it. And again, there's a nice traditional medicinal tea. Um, valerian seems to help some, and again, we think it acts through that serotonin brain pathway, this, all those related brain hormones, um, chemical messengers, showing improvements in menopausal symptoms. Flaxseed, good for us in a whole bunch of ways, but also effective for hot flashes. Two tablespoons twice a day, decreasing hot flashes by half in the people in this study. Um, in diet, I'd say two tablespoons daily, you get omega-3 fats, you get those lignans that are anti-cancer. If you wanna to try to be treating hot flashes, you need to do that twice. But um, ground flaxseed and ideally organic just because they're seeds so the outside can get concentrated with things. Sage has been improved in Europe and in Germany for hot flashes. And of course, like you don't need yogi tea, there's just sage, grow it on your back porch, right? Um, and you can cook with it, make a tea out of it, um, do lots of things with it. I'm just gonna take a couple seconds to talk about soy and say, one, whole soy is safe, potentially even beneficial for people who have hormone receptor positive breast cancer because some studies have showed improved responses to things like tamoxifen for people who have whole soy in their diet. One of the tricky things is, um, it is a genetic thing about how well we break down soy, and the effective part of soy is called S-equal, and about 30% of um, American women, for example, don't break down soy to that, and so that's why they don't get benefit. Um, there is now a supplement, S-equal is out there, and it is moderately effective for vasomotor symptoms. Um, They've done initial studies, and they haven't seen impact on breast and endometrium. With S equal, for someone who's gone through preventive surgeries or natural menopause and has never had a hormone receptor positive cancer, I think it's a great option. For people who have hormone receptor positive cancers, whether it's endometrial, ovary, or breast, I'm still a little cautious because I know we don't know as much as we should. And again, like we're using it, it is a, it's a fermented soy. Um, so it's not that it's unnatural, but it is in pharmacologic doses. So other herbs, kava, one of my favorites. Um, it's good for anxiety, depression in a lot of the Polynesian islands. Like it's used as like a party, like end of the evening, you know, drink because of the anxiolytic and calming effects. Um, St. John's wort also. St. John's wort is structurally very similar to Prozac and actually equally effective to Prozac um, for depression, but also seems to help with some of that mood thing. And again, right, it's working through that serotonin pathway that's related to all of the things that menopause does to our hormones, the melatonin, serotonin similarities. So it, it kind of makes sense. If you look up herbs for decreased libido, like you will get a huge list. And I have 
only had really great luck um, with maca. It's a plant. It's um, used in Peru and a lot of South America as like a, people who are bodybuilders and physically active and things use maca. Very safe, um, improvement in both the um, psychological kind of mood issues around menopause as well as for um, sexual dysfunction and decreased libido. Um, and there's, I put some brands there that I like. And we are kind of out of time and so I'm gonna let you guys use these slides. I just, because we talked about vaginal dryness, I wanted to mention what I think are some good products. And, and the key is like a lot of the products out there have really high osmolality and that can be really irritating to menopausally dried tissues and um, to people who've had pelvic irradiation. Um, and so the pictures that I have here, this Good Clean Love company is really one of my favorites. It has some aloe vera in it. It was developed by a, um, a woman who's a nurse who also worked with radiation patients. Um, and you know, I talked a little bit about estrogen there. So all of these integrative approaches, now let's just take the issue of someone's having surgery. How do we get ready for surgery? Can we think about all those things and can they help us? Absolutely, right? Already in standard Western medicine, we're thinking harder about this. There's something called enhanced recovery after surgery that if you've had surgery, you might have been part of one of these protocols. We're already, we're realizing we shouldn't be telling people not to eat for so long and not letting them eat and drink, that that's not healthy, that we need to really limit narcotic use and general anesthesia when we can, and that we need to get people moving sooner, right? When I like was a resident and fellow, we used to keep people in bed for a couple days, right? And then we realized like, no, 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 that we just lose muscle mass. We just don't give them the tools that are managing their stress nervous system when they need it most. You guys in your slide set have more slides than I kept in mind, um, talking about some of the studies around um, these modalities, both nutrition and mind-body uh, modalities. But just kind of what I do, Obviously, I teach, you know, we'll have everybody do the four, seven, eight breath. You guys already realize that. But, you know, successful surgery is a really nice guided imagery made by this woman, Bella Ruth Knapperstuck, um, that all of the studies show decreased use of pain medicine, decreased anxiety before and after surgery. When it comes to wound healing, plenty of fruits and vegetables to get all of those flavonoids and the anthocyclines and everything else that you need to build tissue, um, but plenty of protein, plenty of protein. And if we take our baseline protein needs around surgery and wound healing can last six months, you know, especially people who have post-radiation breast um, reconstruction, that is a lot of tissue healing, right? And that can be a very long and slow process. So getting enough protein, omega-3 fats, Really important, like I said, not just for managing stress, but for rebuilding tissue and decreasing inflammation, right? Natural inflammation is a part of healing. Too much inflammation is gonna damage that healing process and let, lead to scarring, right? Now, around surgery, you can't do fish oil supplements because then we start talking about things that are leading to some blood thinning, but certainly omega-3 foods like those flax seeds, those ground flax seeds. Um, think about getting enough fiber and fermented foods, because when we think about the microbiome, again, we tend to go to pills and probiotics, things, but what really rebuild our normal flora that get messed up by antibiotics and surgery and blah, blah, are plenty of fiber in our diet, so that's those fruits and vegetables, but those fermented foods, like yogurts with still active cultures, like kombucha, like, you know, now they have stuff that tastes good, like Kavita or other things that you can buy in, in most grocery stores. Pickles, as long as they're fresh, right? The fluid in them is still cloudy, so at the deli and refrigerated, not on a shelf. Sauerkraut, kimchi, right? All of those things are sources of fermented foods that one serving a day seems to get people's microbiome back to normal faster. Plenty of water, plenty of water, plenty of water. I was having crazy headaches, and you know, I was, I would see an acupuncturist, she helped me, and then she was like, and you know, you might be dehydrated. And I was like, oh my God, I tell people 100 times a day to drink water, and I'm dehydrated, and I'm seeing a specialist for it. Anyway, 
It worked. Water, plenty of water. I do um, give people a little bit of vitamin C and zinc around surgery. Now, I do mostly gynecologic surgeries. Uh, I do all gynecologic surgeries. Um, but it seems like that's something that people easily get um, low on and is such an important part of, of collagen and wound repair. You know, throat coat and licorice root tea are part of that traditional medicinal um, teas, but so great for the sore throat. Getting enough sleep perioperatively is really hard because you're uncomfortable, because you're in pain, and especially if you're in the hospital and someone's waking you up every six hours, right? Um, but we do tend to, there's studies showing that melatonin um, perioperatively improves wound healing and outcomes. Um, magnesium is another thing that really people get low in when they're getting IV fluids and other things, but that seems to help with sleep. So this magnesium at night um, and then I just mentioned like an eye mask and headphones. Perioperative activity, really important. Before surgery, thinking even about stretching and strengthening those areas of your body that are having surgery, whether it's upper body or pelvic surgery. Um, and then once you're being allowed to do things, kind of getting back to your old routine as quickly as you can. Again, trying to incorporate that cardio, some strength training and some stretching. Um, but even in the immediate perioperative time, right, trying to get 30 minutes of walking, maybe you, you're not going to be walking 30 minutes in a row after a hysterectomy, but you can get up five or six times and do four or five minutes, right? So it adds up to that 30 minutes. Again, decreasing adhesions, decreasing scar tissue, turning on that parasympathetic nervous system because every time you're in pain, you're going to turn on your fight or flight nervous system. This is a list, and like I said, it'll be in your slide set, of just good sources and reliable brands. The Arizona Center for Integrative Medicine, um, where I trained, um, you can look up their alumni um, list to find people who trained at that program. Anti-Cancer Living is a website from the group at MD Anderson um, that has some really sensible nutrition and even some environmental recommendations. I mentioned Consumer Lab. I mentioned Sloan before. I mentioned Cancer Choices. Sally Foley talks about um, sexual health. She's a nurse from University of Michigan. Really nice, easy to access, like uh, handouts, um, and then some other um, organizations that I think have good um, data, and then some good brands. So, you know, I have so much gratitude to Force. I've been giving talks here and you know, Zoom for a long time now. And I have to say, early on, when we were first like trying to figure out, you know, what's the right way to do risk-reducing surgeries and things, it was like coming and giving a talk and then being asked a bunch of questions and told people's experiences that then I took back and then came back. And that like iterative process, I think, is so great. And uh, organization and then a community like this where you're seeking out information, like everybody benefits um, when you're taking care of yourself. Um, and um, questions, right. OK, I don't know how much time I left. Oh, all right, all right. Yay, questions? Yeah, please. And if you really don't want to come up, you can, okay, and then I'll repeat it. How we doing? So for the lion's mane, would you recommend to have that in your diet or have a supplement of it? Is there much research on that yet? Such a beautiful question. So lion's mane, if you've ever seen it, is like a big glom. You know, and like Andy Wilde does this cool thing where he like slices it up, soaks it in soy and grills it. And it's really delicious. And it seems like that's a fa very effective and probably the most active, right? Because if we think about all these plants, some of them were meant to be dried and used over time and like used over the winter when you couldn't store things. Um, but certainly like there's some benefit. Now all the studies though are done only with supplements. Right, because unfortunately, like, we're lazy and that's what's doing. And then trying to get people to cook things necessarily, like, isn't always fair. And then you don't know, like, they get them at their farmer's market. Is this lion's mane the same as another? Blah, blah. So um, the studies were done. And the company I like, there's um, Host Defense is a good one. Um, and there's another one that I'll think of as we're talking. Um, 
but that I found really helpful for chemo brain, and I've used it for people um, after concussion. I don't take care of that many um, vets, but the data, like I said before, is done in people who've had traumatic brain injuries. Yeah. I just purchased a vibration plate, mm. and it talks about all the benefits mm -hmm. to the body from that. I was wondering if you had come across it or suggest. I've, I've come across it. I haven't seen research on it. I do think anything that, like, activates us, anything that relaxes us, you know, there's all this information that just movement. And, you know, we didn't talk about drumming, but, like, drumming is another one that has, like, a lot of health benefits, both as a listener and as an active participant. And, again, like, if you think about indigenous traditions, like, every single culture, right, Celtics, you know, South American shamanism, Africa, like, drumming happens everywhere. And, again, like, there is, we know, like, the way it alters our nervous system is dramatic. So there's like all this stuff that we do think about when we think about vibration and movement and sound and music. Um, like those things that we feel good, like let's face it, they probably are good for us, depending, right? Our society also is kind of messed up kind of what we think is supposed to be good for us, right? Like all those ads of huge big burgers at Fridays, because thank God it's Friday, like, but do you actually feel better or was it just nice to go out with your friends and have a meal, right? Same as like, you know, I grew up in Chicago. I went to med school around Wrigley Field and like, you know, you just say baseball and I think hot dog, right? But I don't like hot dogs, but I still want one, right? You know, because it's like this thing that's gotten built into me and I had a great time, right? I was there with friends. I was in a certain setting. And so we've created these like relationships or connections between things that aren't good for us, right? And as opposed to like, oh, I had a really bad day. What I really need is a cupcake. Like, no, what I actually need is some protein, right? <laughs> because that's what would help me rebuild and, you know, the, heal myself from the damage of today. Um, or maybe what I really need is some peppermint tea to soothe my stomach because I've been anxious all day, right? But, like, we've built other things in. And unfortunately, I think some of the reasons were natural, but some of them are not because people are making money from those things. And so that's kind of why they've worked their way into our culture. Um, and then I do think that there are some things that probably aren't that bad for us, but then got converted, right? Like cooking a lasagna versus eating a frozen lasagna. Like one of those, like with the fresh tomatoes and onions and ginger, I'm sorry, garlic, right? But we know that like when things get frozen and put preservatives in it and do all this other stuff, it becomes kind of a different entity. Still has obvious nutrient value, right? But like that, you know, that's hard. And totally acknowledging, like it's hard to make fresh food. It's hard to do those things. On the other hand, like, knowing, like, if you set up your life in that way, right, like the nutritionists talk about, like, cooking on a Sunday for the whole week and, you know, what you can chop up to cook for, you know, fresh. This is, of course, a whole other lecture, but um, that there's ways to do it that could free us. And then there's ways to use frozen things and canned things and other th dried things that can still serve us and still have some of the activity of those plants. Yeah, yeah, go for it. Oh, I'm sorry. So my question is about alcohol. I mm. saw on your chart you put one to two glasses a week, but yet I saw red wine was one to two a yeah. day. Is there an so, exception? Right, no, and that's why I put it on that pyramid. I love Andy Weil, but like many people in medicine, like sometimes we think of men as like the default human being. Like, you know, and so, like, all the research is, but for women, like, that much red wine just isn't good. The breast cancer risks go up. The hormone-related cancer risks go up. There's grapes. Hello, resveratrol. It's in grapes. It's in other things. So I, 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 I struggle with alcohol. Again, like, it's so built into our society as, like, a relaxation tool. But I think so much of it is about, like, the ritual, right? Like, the ritual of like popping a champagne cork. Like how many people don't just assume it's a celebration when they hear that noise, right? And so can we recreate that by like 
brewing a cup of tea that smells good to us. And we all sit down and we're like having a cup of tea that smells good. And there's that ritual that we get out of it. Like can we have a coffee ritual. Most of us do have coffee rituals. Can we translate that to relaxing and evening things? So I, I do struggle with it. On the other hand, like if we think about gin, which has juniper in it, and so many of like the liqueurs were based on herbal activities and herbal, like trying to preserve herbal medications and like recognizing like there's a continuum there, right? Same as like bitters. Like bitters, like the drops that you put in aperitifs, really great for turning off stomach acid. And there's a reason it's an aperitif. You do it before you eat because it preps your digestive tract, right? So like there's that balance and moderation. Um, and then the truth is we don't actually always need the alcohol. Like we need the herb. We need the ritual to turn off our sympathetic nervous system. Like we can do all those things. I love the whole like, you know, I, I have a niece who's, you know, in her late 20s and I mean, their whole group, they do mocktails on Wednesdays and Thursdays and Fridays. Like the only night they drink are Friday or Saturdays. And like it's just part of their language. And I think that's like a, something we could learn from, at least, right, I'm in my late 50s. Like I'm used to like the only way you relax. And certainly with college or med school, we did a whole lot of alcohol intake. But we had one more question there. Ah, so I'm just repeating the question for the rec uh, recording. My thoughts on coffee. So coffee is, is not bad. I'll say that first. Possibly beneficial, possibly some decrease in um, pancreatic cancer risks. And um, again, like a really interesting plant. The tricky part is like Coffee clearly turns on or stimulates part of our sympathetic nervous system, right? Increases our heart rate, increases our blood pressure. Now, it's good for cognition. It's good for athletic um, performance. So to me, like, coffee's not so bad. We use it, probably overuse it, and it probably does throw off our sleep cycles. And so being really careful, like, there's, there's 2 p.m. is not a good time for a cup of coffee because it really does throw off our circadian rhythms. Even those of us who still go to sleep will sleep more shallowly because that caffeine, the way it activates things and changes our, like the normal coming down of our cortisol. Um, coffee has other side effects in the way we drink it in that like a lot of people get too much acid and other things. And I struggle a little bit because the flavonoids of black and white and green teas are so good for us that it's almost like coffee is not bad, possibly even it's got some benefits, but like tea is really good for us and it's less caffeine. Um, but I mean, I, I don't have a problem. You know what I mean? I think coffee is great. You know, I, I, don't, I don't think it's bad. And if, if we really needed to take, make a list of the don'ts, I don't put coffee on that in any way. But I do say, like, make a big list of the do's. Like, I do need to eat those five servings of vegetables a day and two to three servings of fruit a day. I do need to get a serving omega-3. I do need to get my 60 grams of protein a day. Like, make a list of the do's. And by the time you get to the bottom of your do's, you will not be hungry, right? I mean, that, that's kind of the problem. And that's what I always say, like, for people who are struggling with it, I'm like, you can eat whatever you want after you eat the dues, right? <laughs> Any other questions? Um, I just have a quick question. I'm a genetic counselor, so I get asked a lot of questions about diet. And um, something I've been wondering, we've, we've been seeing a higher rate of certain types of like GI cancers in people who don't have mutations. Um, and I'm wondering what you think the role of organic food is, whether it's really important to eat organic. I, I'm just trying to imagine all the things in our environment that might be increasing risk for cancer. And we do want people to eat more fruits and vegetables and, and take supplements, but do you think it's really important to get organic supplements and um, you know, knowing that not everyone has access to right. those things? Yeah. So what I'd say if financially and access-wise you have access to organics and you have access to a farmer's market. Um, you're, those are probably the best for us. 
Environmental Working Group has a great website. They have their Dirty Dozen and then their Safe Things. And so there's some things like leafy things and berries where they really suck in the pesticide that makes it more challenging. Um, I mean, I think they're real and I think the endocrine disrupting um, chemicals in pesticides are a real true issue for women and for hormonal cancers. On the other hand, the thing you said, like, is it better to eat a non-organic strawberry? Yeah, I think it kind of is. Um, we do have to be careful about washing things um, and then kind of make those wise choices. I, but I think we need to make the same choices of like, you know, I like the organic products for things you put in your vagina because it absorbs stuff too. Um, and I think if we're thinking about our skin products, right, there's these relationships between things like talc use and ovarian cancer. And clearly there's, you know, products that are not really screened in some way to make sure they don't have anything that's bad for us and we can be more thoughtful about it. And again, Environmental Working Group also has a website called Skin Deep that kind of talks about products. On the other hand, like, do I tell people, like, if you're not eating organic, it's bad? No. Things like bananas and oranges and grapefruits, probably those are okay. Anything you peel is probably technically okay or less damaging in terms of pesticide content. Um, and of course, like the whole movement to organic foods is also about like the people who do the picking and the growing, right? Not growing and picking with pesticides is also a good thing. Um, so if we, could, if we could get to that place that we fixed the affordability and access issues, um, like I think that's a worthy goal. But in terms of counseling people, like I'd, I'd say eat fruit is the more important piece. If you can do organic, great. If you have to make choices, make choices and do it with guidance like from the Environmental Working Group.